can remember very distinctly one of my first days in the cafeteria at Broadview Academy at 16 years of age. It was my, I was a poor village student and eating in the cafeteria was going to be a luxury and I was new and I felt very insecure and it was a large school at that time, had over 200 students. And it just so happened that shortly after I appeared out of the line where you got your food, that there was a fairly confident young man who was a senior, I was a junior, and he appeared out of nowhere, walked up to me while I'm standing there in front of all of those people in that cafeteria, and he laid his silverware on my tray and kind of in a smart aleck way said, hey, thanks for taking care of that for me or something like that. And I'm standing there feeling like, I don't know who this guy is, but I don't like him. <laughs> now, this morning I'm gonna to talk to you about our stories. And I want to assure you that God's people are either going to lead the way or they're going to be left behind. It's not just being the head and not the tail. It's actually the chances are we're going to be left behind. Now, following Jesus, no worries. We won't be left behind. That's why we're having communion this morning is because communion it was, allows us to make sure that the full advantage of our family place is maximized. The full advantage of our family witness is maximized. And I just want to tell you today, by and large, the world's not listening to the church. We have churches, go, we have mega churches. We have churches that are seven, eight, nine, ten times bigger than the whole city of Bering Springs in this country. And by and large, their ability to affect the culture is about as big as the space between my fingers. But it does seem to me that everywhere Jesus went, he drew a crowd and people listened. So I want to talk to you about credibility this morning. I want to talk to you about how to get the world's attention to the degree that God would interface us with the world. And I want to talk to you about our story because if nobody's listening, something's wrong. Every once in a while, there are books that come out that I think capture Christian principles through the paradigm or the framework of a worldview, a business worldview. Years ago, Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great, an amazing book that I believe was the data achieved knowledge of the principles that made some businesses stand out. And should we be surprised that those businesses were led by very humble men who weren't trying to make it all about them they had exceptionally good sense of purpose and they had an exceptionally good fabric for solving problems. They became like family. They did more than make money. They actually cared. An amazing book. A couple weeks ago, my son said to me, Dad, you ought to listen to this book. And I'm going to encourage all of you to listen to it. It's a book called Crucial Conversations. And I had a little time in the car and I was listening, and I came up to a chapter on stories. Now, I believe the authors of this book have studied and watched long enough to learn what the Bible told us a long time ago. In other words, they had to take the long way around the barn through social science to discover the things that were already in the Bible. That's what made Good to Great such an amazing book, and that's what makes this book so unique. But as I listened to chapter five on stories, I was convinced that everybody has a chance to get the story right and everybody has a chance to write a good story. Now, when Howard laid his, when Howard laid his silverware on my tray, young, insecure newbie standing in front of 200 people eating lunch, I thought the whole world was watching him humiliate me. And I decided that I didn't want anything to do with him. But you know, God is pretty good about what he does. He's amazingly good. But wouldn't you know it, I needed a job to work at Broadview Academy. And back in the days, 
So many thousand academy students were the recipients of a man named uh, Harris, who had started a huge manufacturing of furniture. And so for a period of three or four decades, young people like me went to school making chairs and tables and dressers. It just so happened that after all those jigs came down and squeezed all the dresser pieces together, and after all those young would-be furniture makers had pounded the legs and put the rockers on the rocking chairs, and after all those people doing piece rate made all those tables, most of them had to go to one place in that Harris Pine plant, and that was the paint room. And in the paint room, all of that furniture was dipped or sprayed. Well, wouldn't you know it, that's where Howard worked, and that's where I had to work. And there we were, stuck together. I had to be with Howard. It was a good thing, because we as human beings have a proclivity of writing very incomplete stories. We have a tendency to write what the authors of Crucial Conversations will call our clever stories, stories that make us into victims and make somebody else into villains. Stories that are incomplete. And of course, the Bible says every man seems right until you hear the other side. And there I was working with Howard. And every day, Howard did what Howard was good at doing. He had a Texas drawl. He didn't belong in Illinois, I don't think. But God had placed him there. And every day, Howard made people laugh. And I can still remember the wonderful time I had working in the back with Howard. And when we probably should have been working a little harder, occasionally Howard was doing the same thing he did to me that first day in the cafeteria, just being Howard. He wasn't out to humiliate me. He was just coming up to smile and make you laugh a little. I just wasn't laughing that day. But later on, I realized Howard was nothing but an easygoing Texan with a smooth accent and a great smile. And I can still remember the day Howard said, hey, let's make a paper, let's make an airplane of one of these furniture boxes. And the biggest glider that maybe has ever been made in a, in a Seventh-day Adventist Academy campus was made back there in the paint room. And then he took it and he flew it, reared back, took all he had. With that great Texas arm, he sent it a gliding. And wouldn't you know, your sins will find you out because that airplane went floating through the air, had a lot of momentum, went up and stuck right in the roof for everybody to see that we had probably been goofing off instead of working. This was Howard. I needed my story to be completed. I needed to see more than I saw in the first chapter that was written. And you know, if there's anything that's going to get the attention of the world, it's going to be happy families where mom and dad are having the crucial conversations, where they don't take the, uh, the coward's way out and they go either into silence or explosion mode. Those who silence themselves refuse to have the conversations because they say it won't do any good and it'll turn me into a victim. That person has power over me. And those who, who detonate the TNT, they blow it up and in the name of it had to be done, nobody else is doing it, they're rude and unkind. But somewhere in the in-between zones, there's stories to be written that help us understand each other better and help us write a better story for Jesus. Now, in our bulletin this morning, there's, there's quite a quotation. And, and I want to read it with you, but I don't actually have my bulletin here, so I'm going to borrow one from somebody. And take, take your bulletin out. I want to read the quote with you. This is what it says. And remember, the question of the sermon is, is anybody listening? Love and unity distinguish the true believers from the world. It's easy to come here on church and go, go to a Sabbath school and keep the Sabbath day holy in measure. It's a lot harder to love the people who are making you late and stressing you out. And it's easy to have a good argument on the way to church, isn't it? It's kind of too bad it works that way. It's a lot harder to love and keep the law through love than it is to pharisaically and legalistically keep the law by not doing something that I'm not supposed to do. But when the standard is love, it takes a lot more work because something real has to kick in. And I go beyond the letter of the law. But love and unity 
would distinguish the true believers from the world. Now, obviously, we can't always be in unity because sometimes there's moral issues that separate us. But there are some people who, in the name of morality, aren't very careful in how they have these crucial conversations. And the story they write in the name of Jesus isn't very beautiful. Reading on, if this unity does not exist, we need not count ourselves as Christ's disciples, for the love we cherish for one another is the sign to the world that we're Christ's disciples. Now, I want you to think about this. I can proclaim that Saturday's right and Sunday's not. I can tell you that when you die, you're dead, you don't float off to heaven, and you don't descend into hell. I can talk to you about the fact that there'll be no secret about Jesus coming. It'll be like lightning. By the way, we had a little on Thursday night. And I can go over the dynamics of a prophetic role in the end time prophetic messaging. But you know what? Paul will write that if I got all that down, but I don't love, I'm a clanging gong tingling symbol. When it comes to love and unity, it takes people actually letting an amazing work go on in their hearts that Christ alone is able to do. And that's why unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. There's no way that a pastor or elders or deacons or deaconesses or Sabbath school leaders can grow a church into a unified sweet whole. But when someone comes into a congregation where you have a predominant experience of individuals who are letting Jesus write the story. There's a sweetness and a unity and a harmony. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't need an education, even a college education, to figure out there's a different culture and ethos about that group. They actually love each other. She goes on to write, Want of love and confidence in one another have a leavening influence upon the mind and the character. We cannot afford that our course of action shall testify to the world that we are a sham, a pretense, not disciples in deed and true. So how does this thing work? Well, if we were going to take the time, I'm not going to look it up, but if we went to Numbers chapter 16, we'd see that Korah, Dathan, and Abiram had a story about Moses, didn't they? You take too much upon yourself, they said. The whole congregation's holy. Who do you think you are? And the Bible says Moses fell on his face. Now, of course, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram didn't know all the times that Moses prayed, Lord, let somebody else carry this burden. They didn't know how many times Moses said, Lord, if you can't take them into the promised land, blot me out of the book of life. They had a partial story, and they saw Moses in some form as a leader, high and lifted up, and they couldn't begin to understand the weightiness of his call. And Moses said, yes, God's going to have to write the rest of this story. And sometimes God has to do that. God's got to get in the mix, like Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel, and this is what he prayed in 1 Kings 18. He said, Lord, show them that you're God. That's the first thing. Secondly, God, since you asked me to do this, show them that you asked me to do this, that I'm your servant, and I've done these things at your command. And all of a sudden, fire came down out of heaven. I can imagine on that day in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, when finally, after Moses pled with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and Moses had to say, you need to step back from their tents that God was getting ready to rewrite the story and say, you know what, I picked these people, foibles, problems, mistakes and all, but I picked these people. And there's parts of their stories you don't understand. And so after those 250 valiant men of Israel had sided with Korah, Dathan and Byram, all Moses had left was for God to rewrite the story. And what a sad thing when the earth begins to tremor and quake and all of a sudden it opens and into a crevasse fall the rebels. Moses had a difficult job and God was at work making sure that his people's story had his signature on it. For us in the 21st century, I think the world's actually trying to figure out are there any credible Christians out there? Do they actually know how to have the crucial conversations? Remember, Matthew 18 says, if you have aught between your brother, go and talk with him. And Luke or Leviticus chapter 19 says, 
Don't hold a grudge against your people. Speak frankly with them. Don't harbor sin on their account and love your neighbor as yourself. These are God's methods. But you know, as the authors of Crucial Conversations will say, you can take the same facts and you can tell a thousand different stories. But like the Bible says, the one thing that separates the clever stories from the true stories is getting all the information that's out there to get. Now, this morning, I want to rejoice in the fact that this village church that's here on the premises, and to the degree those that are a part of our church online, whether in membership or in community of participating with us, God has given us here in this location especially a sweetness and a union and a oneness that allows us to actually do things that you can't do without it. And I want to rejoice today for the provision God's made because only God can build a church where people actually love each other. Nobody can do that. But when enough people actually encounter the living God and he prompts you to have the crucial conversations and he keeps you, and by the way, I'll give you a little spoiler on the book. When immediately you have negative interpretation of the facts, you've got, a, you've got emotions that have twisted the story most of the time. The way to test if, you're, if your uh, love factor is properly in place is to be able to hear a story, of course, mindful that the story you're listening to is not in a terrible, egregious violation of somebody's rights or privileges, but let's just take an ordinary run-of-the-mill story. When your emotions kick in quickly, you've got a twisted story, and you probably need a crucial conversation. When they go out and do these seminars in these companies, you know what the company, what most of the people ask themselves? Why do we have to go to all this work? Well, Jesus answers that. He said, they will know you are my disciples when you have love for one another. And he says, writing through Paul, love covers over a multitude of sins. And Peter will say, love each other fervently. This is the call of God's people. And you know, we can, we can proclaim, we can build, we can do, we can give, we can raise, we can come. But at the end of the day, it's love that makes us happy. And it's love that distinguishes us from all the other professors. Because if love is the fulfillment of the law, God knows whether you're fulfilling the law of love or not. And you may be able to convince everybody else that I'm, I'm a good person, but the real test of goodness is a test that God alone can give to you. And in time, he may have to display what is and what isn't. One of the amazing phrases I took away from their book is, that it's important that you talk it out or else you'll act it out. As one group said years ago when I was receiving some of my training, you cannot not tell your story. Is there a root of bitterness? Is there something operating that puts your emotions in the mode of negativity? Then you probably need a crucial conversation and that's part of what communion's about. And I just want to remind you that as uncomfortable as it is, that first communion that Jesus had, where we transitioned from the Old Testament Passover to the New Testament celebration of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, it was a very uncomfortable communion. They didn't want him to wash their feet, and they weren't willing to wash his. One person had already struck a deal to betray him, Another person was going to deny that he even knew him, and all of them were going to run away. Jesus would sit at a table where they had been vying for who was going to be the top dog. And finally, when it was all done and they sang a hymn and they crossed the Kidron Valley, nobody would stay awake to pray for him. Churches don't work because we have customers and patrons and people who sell you a set of religious goods and make sure you're happy. Churches work because they work as families, and families that work good love each other. And if you want to be in a real church that loves each other and can get somebody to listen, just be prepared to pay a high price, but know the joy of loving, which is an intrinsic reward, and being loved, which is also on the inside. There's nothing quite like it, but fakes, 
are not accepted in God's communion. You're, you're welcome here no matter what. But if you want to take the name of Jesus and you want to be a part of the remnant church, the standard's high, and no human being can hold you to that standard except the people closest to you. But the real deal is this. Either it works or it doesn't work. Either it's real or it's unreal. But I praise God that for the largest part of this congregation, there's a commitment to keep it real in private. There's a commitment to keep it real in relationships. And by God's grace, that's allowing us to do some pretty amazing things together. <laughs> and you know, we're, we're on a journey. We just purchased this property here. But the way that happened so fast kind of inclines me to think that God's looking to do a little bit more. And we're going to need an awful lot of unity as we go forward. A lot of praying, a lot of talking, crucial conversations. I believe in it. It's the Bible way. It's the only way that works. And while no, we don't go into cowardly silence, and no, we don't go into abusive, blow it up confrontation. We guard our heart so we don't think any evil. And then we have the conversations. If you're not doing that, you're going to have a hard time having communion with the people you're with. And if it's people here, you're not in communion. And you may even tell yourself a story that you're a victim and, and she's a villain. It doesn't work, though. God writes the stories. And God speaks to his children. And so this morning, as we get ready to break, to go wash feet, if you need to talk to somebody, you may not have time to work it all out right here, but you might want to go be with that person and say, when you get a few minutes, I wouldn't mind visiting. Because we don't come to communion four times a year just to do something the church has done for a few thousand years. We come to communion to make sure we keep our relationships rightly calibrated with each other and with Jesus. This is a rededication service. And you wouldn't want to just go through it like it's a rote ceremony. And by the way, how did Jesus keep his stories right? I mean, couldn't he have written a story of these no good human beings? Couldn't he have been cursing like the two, two, two criminals on each side of him? Couldn't he have actually pronounced a divine curse as an innocent man being sacrificed with the brutality of a Roman guard, a corrupt governor, and a worse than corrupt church? But the way Christian churches work and the way Christians work is because they've been forgiven and they're loved, they can offer forgiveness and suffer what the cost of forgiveness is. Because when you forgive somebody, you don't exact from them the pain they placed on you. And so Jesus' story, as it's written, is he knows who he is in God's family. He knows what he came to do. And he sees what people can become. And some of those people that put him on the cross became his children. Oh, yeah. He could say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he'd have no malice, no hatred. This is the bar. It's set by Jesus. And if we want to be true Christians, this is how we live. And it produces the sweetest, most beautiful communion. It's worth it, friends. What we're about to do is an open communion service. Anybody that's here is welcome to participate in it. We separate and wash each other's feet as a statement of reminding ourselves of the humility of the creator God of the universe who stooped to wash other people's feet. After we wash feet, we come back into this place. We partake of unleavened bread, which represents his body, and unfermented wine, which represents drops of blood that literally fell on the stones of Golgotha. The hope and the goal is, is that we're re-reminded of the great cost paid for our salvation, and it brings a great humility and a large reservoir of grace to offer to each other. And thus we get that love and unity that shows the world that something really different is going on here. It's not just talk. And then we'll find out more and more people are listening who wouldn't want to, to a storyline of love. The ladies will wash each other's feet in the fellowship hall. The gentlemen will be downstairs in the youth room underneath that fellowship hall. We have a room set up that will probably only accommodate about two dozen couples in the Russian and early teen area. And when we're all done, we'll come back here and celebrate 
the amazing plan of salvation where Jesus became a man and suffered so that we wouldn't have to.